Every Sunday morning we are teaching on false doctrine as opposed to the true doctrine of God. And of course, the word doctrine in the Greek text, we put this on the board every week, is the word D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A, didaskalia. That's one of the words. The common word is the word D-I-D-A-C-H-E, didache. And these words doctrine, people say, well, doctrine doesn't seem to matter. Well, doctrine is everything. Of course, doctrine, the word doctrine means instruction. That's like saying instruction doesn't mean anything. Instruction is everything. You cannot just uh, uh, go about doing your work on your job without some kind of instruction. And many of you have gone to college and had four, six, eight years of instruction on how to teach a particular certain subject or uh, to be able to go about doing a particular certain job. Well, you have to understand the instruction of the Scripture. Now, the Bible was written in the Greek text. The New Testament was written in the Greek. The Old Testament was written in the Hebrew. Now, whenever you see me put a word up on the board, for those of you that hadn't been here, when you see me put on a word on the board, that's because we get it out of the Greek text. Now, we do have the original text of the Bible. It's called an interlinear Bible, and it has, the, it has the Greek on the top line and the English under it. The English is not the inspired Word of God. The King James Bible is not the inspired Word of God. The Textus Receptus, the Greek text, is the inspired Word of God. And, uh, uh, and whenever we begin to study these things, we use a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. This has a Hebrew dictionary in the back, and it has a Greek dictionary in the back. And if you're looking up a New Testament word, it'll be in the Greek dictionary. Uh, Old Testament word will be in the Hebrew dictionary. Now, <coughs> I have uh, uh, promised you each week that I would give you something about the culture of the first century and even predating the first century. Now, we are talking about <coughs> doctrine that the Bible says, if anyone comes preaching any other doctrine, that we are not to bid them God's speed. Now, God's speed doesn't mean to go fast as God goes. That's not what it means. It's the word caro, C-H-A-I-R-O, and it means to be cheerful. The Bible says we don't receive men into our households, and we don't... Uh, and we don't bid them God's speed. Of course, the word from Carol, we get the word charis, which is the word grace. We're not to be gracious to people. And, and whenever I say this, uh, some people say, am I supposed to be nasty to people? No, we're to be cordial to people. But as far as taking people into our confidence and into our intimate relationship with as friends and as people that uh, uh, are intimately close to us, we're not supposed to be doing that when men are when they're preaching another doctrine. Well, if they're preaching another instruction, how are you going to know what that is? Well, the way you find out what instruction is, you study the original text, you look up the words, you go to the culture, you find out what these things mean. Y'all have to excuse me. I th felt like I was looking through something dirty there on my glasses. And I'll need to clean them off. I should have done this before hand, but we're not that fancy here, so if, my, if I discover something, I'll do it right then. Now, we're talking about doctrine, and I promise you that I'm going to go back into the culture. Since today is November the 31st, huh? October 31st, excuse me. Since today is October the 31st, and did I say 30? 30th? Tomorrow's the 31st, Okay. I'm sorry. Since we're right at all Halloween, I'm going to read some things to you out of some cultural books about Halloween and where it comes from. Now, we all understand that Halloween is pagan. But what men need to understand, it's not disassociated with the Christmas or with the Christ Mass. There's some words you have to look up. If you just look up the word Halloween, you're not going to find what you want to find on it. Halloween comes from the word Hallowed Evening. It means the, it's a Roman Catholic unholy day, just like the Christ Mass is a Roman Catholic unholy day. And I've got 
And there are certain books you need to have to look up when you're going to study Halloween, and there's certain subjects. Now, the word Halloween it comes from, let me write this down. It means Hallowed Evening, Evening, and uh, there's old, there are old ancient words for the word Halloween. The old ancient, the most ancient of the titles, it was one of the old ancient sun festivals of the Celts. Now, if you're going to study Halloween, you're going to have to study the Celts. It's, it's pronounced Celt. Uh, we say Balton Celtics, but it's Celts when you, when you pronounce the old uh, word out of the ancient world. And the Celts' religion was Druid worship. Now, the Celts were barbarians. They were uh, marauders is what they were. They were, like a bunch of, uh, they were like a bunch of gypsies raging and rampaging across the land. And they didn't settle down long enough to grow anything. So they weren't into agriculture. And they, they uh, covered most of what we call the Turkish Peninsula. They, they marauded across here and they, and they came across over into the European continent and then over into Spain. And they settled most of the Druidic worship you're going to find in England or in Ireland or in Scotland. Now, you're going to have to study the Celts. This was a sun worship just as the Christ Mass was a sun worship. And if you're going to study this, you've got to look up the Druid religions. There's three things that the Druids worship. They worshiped the tree. They worshiped the tree. And they worshiped the sun. And they worshiped the serpent. The serpent. And of course, that goes back to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil into the garden. And Satan uh, taking the form of a serpent. And the sun was, since the serpent, they said, was the enlightener of men's minds, they would worship the orb or the sun, the orb of the day. Now, Halloween has many names. It, when the Roman Catholics brought this old Druidic worship into the church, the reason the Roman Catholics brought Halloween and Christ's Mass and Ishtar into the church it was to amalgamate Christianity and paganism. What they were wanting to do, they were wanting to uh, uh, cause the pagans to accept uh, the, uh, the worship of the Christians, and they wanted the Christians to accept the worship of the pagan. Of course, this happened on another scale in the, in the Feast of Saturn or the Saturnalia. Now, the Saturnalia was an old ancient festival that began on December the 17th and went through December the 24th. And this was the Feast of Saturn. Feast of Saturn. And Saturn was the cold planet. And the old ancient pagans, I've got to give you this on the Saturnalia to explain Halloween because Halloween is merely the Celtic form of the Saturnalia. It's just, it was the end of the harvest. It was the end of harvest. And this was the time of what we call the uh, autumn equinox. Now that word equinox means equal night. That means there were 12 hours in the day and 12 hours in the night. And at that point in the year, on, uh, on November the 1st, at the end of the harvest, that is where the sun begins to wane and it begins to grow darker. And as we go into November and December, uh, we, that's exactly why last night they gave us daylight savings time so we could save an hour because during the summer, during the summer, uh, we find that the sun is at its, at its height and it doesn't get dark until about 8.30 or 9 o'clock during the summer. It starts getting dark 
at 5 o'clock in the evening, the closer we go into the winter, it's just pitch dark nearly at 5 o'clock in the middle of December. And the whole purpose of all of this, the whole purpose of this Saturnalia uh, was because on December the 21st, this was called the winter solstice. At the winter solstice are the longest nights of the year. That's the longest night of the year. They believe the sun was burning out and that it was dying. They said the sun was dying. So what they needed to do, the, the biggest problem in the ancient world, they did not have the, the modern methods of curing meats that we have and storing foods. They didn't have Kroger's down here. And when the sun began to, when the winter began to, to come on and the sun began to wane at the equinox, all the pagans said, we're going to have to get to the spring in order to, we're going to have to get to the spring in order to uh, have food or have crops in the spring. Well, now, what was it that God told Abraham? God told Abraham in the 17th chapter of Genesis. He said, I'm going to form my covenant with you. I'll be your people. I'll be your God. You'll be my people. And you'll get the covenant, and you'll get the land. And as long as you're obedient to me, he said, I'll fill up your womb, I'll fill up your fields, I'll fill up your, your crops. He said, you'll have the richest of crops. And he said, I'll fill up your storehouses. Well, that our God is the true fertility God, but they said that the Son was the fertility God. And God promises that he will cause... Israel to be fertile as long as they serve him. Well, what does the Saturnalia and Halloween have to do with the Bible? That is the old ancient Baal worship, Baal and grove worship. Baal was just a generic name for Hercules, and he was said to be the child of the sun. The child of the sun and and the representative of the sun upon the earth was fire. And that's what the fire worship was about. When Israel went after Baal, they went after the same system that Constantine brought into the church in 325 A.D. And they called this, uh, they called this uh, the Christ Mass. Christ Mass. And all of that dates back to Israel going after the sun worship from 1 Samuel through 2 Chronicles, this is the time period that they were a nation up on the earth. They went after Baal and the grove, and because they did this for a 500-year period, God said, I'll send four judgments, the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and he says this over and over and over, just repeatedly all through the Old Testament. And the final thing he says I'll send is the beast. And we know that the beast is Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. And he said, I will scatter you all over the face of the earth if you go after these idol gods. Well, Israel went after Baal in the grove. And these were just generic names for all the male deities, whether the males were, the males were uh, Tammuz, or whether it was Adonis, or Achilles, or Marduk in Babylon, or Baal in Israel, or Hercules in Babylon, or Hercules... Uh, and, and, it, and, the, and the list goes on and on. And these were generic names for Nimrod who began the system of Babel in Genesis, the 11th chapter. And the female deities, the female, and they were all one, actually just one deity depending on, these were generic names depending on what nation that you were worshiping in. And then, of course, the female deities were, uh, was Venus, was Venus, and of course Venus 
when you, and you say, Jim, how do you find out these things? You, you need, uh, let me just write the names of some of the books down that you need. Here's some of the books you need. You need Hastings, Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion. This is a 13-volume set. You need McClinic and Strong. McClinic and Strong. It's actually Cyclopedia of Biblical, Ecclesiastical, and Theological Literature. That's this set right here. And you don't just look up Christmas. You look up all the ancient pagan deities. You look up Saturn. You look up, uh, you look up Tammuz. You look up... Baal, you look up, when you look up Hercules in the McClinic and Strong, it will tell you that it's the Tyrian Baal or the Baal of Tyre. Well, it was the Tyrian princess Jezebel that, that came down and married Ahab, the king of northern Israel. And this system that we call Halloween or that we call Christ's Mass permeated Israel. Now, people say, well, I just never heard this before. If you lived 150 years ago, Everyone knew that Christmas was paganism back then. My grandfather, great-grandfather, knew that Christmas was Christ's Mass. It was Roman Catholicism, and it was paganism. Well, of course, uh, you need... Uh, I've got all kinds of books on Celts. Uh, I've got dozens of books just on Celtic religion in my library. Uh, this is one called Celtic Myth and Religion. I've got books written here by... This is by a witch. Her name is E. Dane McCoy, and she's one of the best historians on the background of this. And this is called the Sabbats. And there's eight points, eight Sabbaths in the ancient world. And then uh, she's also got one. And, and the thing is, just because she's a witch, it doesn't mean she don't know her history because she does. Because McClinic and Strong and Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion will verify what she is saying is true. And here's one called Celtic Myth and Magic. And uh, she goes through each one of the eight holidays. And remember the eight holidays? What were the eight holidays? Does anybody remember? I'm not saying name them, but what were they generally for? Or how do we identify them? Let me, let me erase them. It was the fire wheel. It was the fire wheel of the ancient world. It was the fire wheel. And what was the fire wheel? The fire wheel was the, what they call the wheel of the year. The wheel of the year. And this is where the wreath comes from. And sometimes it would be represented in the form. You've got eight. Sometimes it would be represented in the form of a sheaf. There'd be a sheaf here and a sheaf here and a sheaf down here and a sheaf here. This was called the wheel of the year. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight points on the swastika. And that was the wheel of the year. This was a peace symbol 2,000 years ago. In fact, the symbol of the Boy Scouts of America in the 1920s, in the 1920s before Adolf Hitler ever got a hold of this peace symbol out of the ancient world, the Boy Scouts of America was a swastika with a, I can't remember how you draw it, like a fleur de lis right in the middle of it, flower of the lily, Something like that. Fleur de lis, right in the middle of the swastika. That was the Boy Scout symbol in America in the 1920s. And this comes out of the ancient world. Comes out of the ancient world. There are eight points. Let me draw that again. There are eight points on the swastika. And you say, what does this have to do with the Bible? It has everything to do with it. This goes back to Bible times. And this has to do with the ancient world. Let me... Let me uh, put down these, these holidays, what this was. This was to ensure the ancient world among the pagans. They said that the, that, the, that the mother of the gods turned the wheel of the year, and you'll notice that it's going from right to left, that the, that the, the arms of the, what they call the twisted cross in the ancient world, is breaking to the left, well, that's called left in the, left in the uh, Latin is the word sinus. Sinus. And when we say sinister, 
in the ancient world, a left-handed man was said to be sinister. He said he was to be evil. Well, God showed Israel that left-handed men weren't evil because he sent them a left-handed man named Ehud to deliver them from, uh, from their wickedness. Well, these are the eight points of the fire wheel of the ancient year. Now, sometimes this fire wheel was called Yule. Now, Yule means wheel or child. Now, this fire wheel was something that they would use in the Scandinavian countries. They would roll this fire wheel downhill. They would set a particular line down there. And if they said that if it would roll to a certain point, then they would have crops in the spring. And that was their great concern. Let me, let me put these holidays, their ancient pagan holidays. This top point on the left was called Mabon. Mabon, and then you had Lugnashada. This point right here was, this was the holiday, L-U-G-N-H-N-A-S-A-D-A-H, or D-H. Lugnashada, and this point right here, this holiday right here, was called Ostera. Ostera, and that is what we call Easter and, of course, Easter comes from Ishtar. And Ishtar comes from the, from the Greek word A-S-T-E-R. And that is the word star. And all these female and male deities, uh, Venus, I didn't finish my list of female deities, but Venus, Aphrodite, and so forth, all those female deities and the male deities were represented in the stars, whether it's Jupiter, whether it's Orion, and so forth. Well, aster is the word star in the Greek, and that's where they worship the stars. That's where Easter comes from, or Ishtar. Now, yes, we believe that Jesus was God in the flesh. He is born of a virgin. He died to save sinners. But the Ishtar and, and Halloween and Saturnalia have nothing to do with Jesus. They never did. Now... Ishtar, this is Ishtar or Ostera here, and we get the word A-S-H-T-O-R-E-T-H. Whenever Solomon allowed his wives to go after Ashtoreth, uh, when he allowed them to go after Ashtoreth, that's the tree deities of the ancient world. That's the tree worship or the grove of the ancient world. And when Israel went after grove and Baal, God destroyed them and scattered them all over the face of the earth for 2,600 years for going after these deities. And it's everything that prophecy is about. Now, this point right here is Imbog. Imbog. And then this down here, this is what they call Midsummer. And each one of these has, I'm, I don't have time to go on each one of them. This is Midsummer. That's their holiday of Midsummer. And uh, this was also called St. John's Fire. Now, this is what Roman Catholicism, St. John's Fires, this is what Romanism brought into the church. And what they were doing, they were trying to pacify these pagans. Now, this right down here is called Beltane. B-E-B-E-A-L-T-A-I-N-E. -E -E, and this is in February. And this, we get Beltane from the word Baal. And Baal was the sun deity that Israel went after. And then right over here, that left bottom point on the wheel of the year, that left bottom point is called Yule. A thousand years before the birth of Jesus, this, a uh, thousand years before the birth of Christ, we had this Baal worship going on in the world, and it was called Yule. Now, people say, well... Uh, how, can you verify that more? Here's a book. I like this. Here's a book. This is for Roman Catholics, Inside Catholicism. This was not written to put down Catholicism. This was written, this was written to encourage Roman Catholics. Now, back here in the back of it, they will tell you. Here is something that they call the Christmas altar. Now, the reason I have to bring out Christmas and Halloween at the same time, they're one in the same system. Uh, 
Roman Catholics will tell you the truth about Christmas or Christ Mass. It is the Mass of Christ. The Christmas altar. And they start off like this. This is a Roman Catholic book. Before Christianity. Now, how's that for starting off? Uh, we're going to tell you about the, the Christmas altar. Before Christianity, the Christmas season was celebrated in Europe as the feast of the Yule. That was the fire wheel. Sometimes they would call the entire wheel by the title of this old ancient festival called the Saturnalia in the ancient world. And then he goes on to say, a time to rekindle the light of the darkened sun as it began to burn bright again after the winter solstice around December the 21st. Evergreens, lighted trees, and gift-giving. This is long before Christianity. All stem from the Yule Feast adopted like many traditions into the stream of Christianity. Now, now, now why did they have this festival of Saturn? Why did they do that? The same reason they had the Halloween. This last point that I'm bringing out this is the eighth festival of sun worship in the ancient world, and it was called S-A-M-H-A-I-N. It's pronounced Samhain. Some people will pronounce it Samhain. That is the festival that the Roman Catholics brought into the Roman Catholic Church and named Halloween. It was a time in the ancient world in the Druid worship it was a time in the ancient world for the dead to come back, for demons to walk the earth. And, of course, we don't believe in demons here. It's a time for demons to walk the earth and for all kinds of evil spirits and witches to come forward. Now, when we talk about witches, we, when the Bible says in Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, a witch in, during the time of Moses was not some old hag uh, with a hooked nose and warts on her nose riding around on a broom. That's not what a witch was. The word witch is the word kasaf in the Hebrew. It means to whisper or to speak smooth words. That's what it means. To speak smooth words. Now, I was giving you some books you need to get to study these things, and you're going to have to look up the Celts. You're going to have to look up the Druids. You're going to have to look up Samhain. You're going to have to research all... This is what the Roman Catholics called it when they put it in the church. All Hallows' Eve... And our All Saints Day, All Saints Day, and this was a time they merely brought this into the church, convoluted it, and said, what we will do is we will appease uh, the pagans and appease Christianity. Halloween was nothing less than the feast of Saturn among the Celts. It was the same system. Now, of course, when Constantine brought the feast of Saturn into the church. They thought the sun was burning out because it was getting darker at that time of the year. And their great problem was they wanted uh, food in the spring. They said, how are we going to have food? Look over here. Here's how you have food in Genesis, the 17th chapter. Genesis 17. Here's how we have food from God. God says, I'm going to establish my covenant... And their greatest concern was, what are we going to eat? Where are we going to eat? Where are we going to get our food? And, and what is the first judgment that God would bring up on Israel? It was famine. God said, if you don't come after me, I will dry up your fields. I will stop the rain. Is that not what, is that not what God said to uh, Ahab and Jezebel, when they brought Baal worship and the grove worship in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings, 
and they made it the national god and goddess of Israel. They made Hercules and Venus the sun god and the tree goddess. They made that the national religion of Israel. And what did God do in the 17th chapter of 1 Kings? He sent this wild man named Elijah. He said, go up there and tell them there will be no rain for three and a half years. And they begin to die by the hundreds of thousands. And America is immersed in this. And of course... What they wanted, they had, they had to have their, they had to bring the sun back because the winter solstice was here. So they said, we will appeal to the coal god, and Saturn was the coal planet. So they said, we will appeal to Saturn to bring us, to bring the sun back. It's burning out. And so that's where they get the new year. The new year was the birth of what they called Natalis, Solus, you recognize that, that means sun. Natalis, Solus, and Victi. And that is a word that means the, the birth of the unconquerable sun. So at the new year, they would pass around gifts in the pagan world 1,500, 2,000 years before the birth of Jesus because the sun was being birthed. Yes, our new year is just as pagan as everything else. Now, I'm trying to bring out to you, of course, this was brought into the church. In 325 A.D., the mass was brought into the church when Constantine started Roman Catholicism and he started this system, brought into the church called it Christ or Christus Masse, M-A-E-S-S-E, Christus Masse, and Christus Masse means the mass of Christ. Now, the mass is, it's very simple. It's a simple thing. It's uh, when the, when I do that book, when the priest, everything in Catholicism, everything, is the focal point is the mass. When they raise that little, that Eucharist into the air, this happens hundreds of thousands of times a day in Catholic churches all over America. Now, Gerald, you were Roman Catholic. How many masses did they have in your church when you were? Three. Had three a day. And they say each time that they have this mass, that this turns into the literal body in blood of Christ. And it's a bloodless altar. That's what they said the altars in the ancient world, they said that the queen of heaven, queen of heaven, was a bloodless altar. And the queen of heaven had many names or titles. Venus, Malita, Aphrodite, now in and so forth. Malita means female, female mediator. Female mediator. That is a mediatrix. That's what Mary is called in Roman Catholicism. What is a mediatrix? That is a go-between, between one person and someone else. They've said that the Queen of Heaven was the mediatrix in the ancient world, or she was the go-between between the sun of the sun god and the, and the people in the world. She mediated. When, when this was brought into Roman Catholicism, Malita, or the Queen of Heaven, Mary was called Queen of Heaven, wasn't she? In Roman Catholicism, here it is right here. Let me find this. I've got it right here. There it is right there. Mary, Queen of Heaven. See? Queen of Heaven, uh, though exceeded from mostly masculine, holy trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Mary's key role in Catholic worship has never faltered. A testament to the need of a feminine element in spiritual practice in the 15th century, devotion to Mary was at its height. This painting 
combines the immaculate conception, the assumption, and the coronation of the virgin as the queen of heaven. What was the queen of heaven? Wasn't Israel indicted for worshiping the queen of heaven? Look at Isaiah, look at Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah 44. You say, Jim, what is the importance of all this? It's the very essence of paganism is going on in the church today. Look here. And it's all Roman Catholicism. Go over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the 44th chapter. Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah is telling Israel. Jeremiah is the last. Jeremiah is the very last prophet prophesying against Israel because they went after Baal in the grove. They did not keep the statutes of God and his commandments and his laws. And Jeremiah is preaching against Israel. This is right around 587, 86 B.C. They're carried into captivity in 586 by the Babylonians, B.C. And Jeremiah is preaching to them probably from about 601 all the way down to 586. He's preaching for years to them, and he's telling them, God's fixing to destroy you because you've gone after all of this. Look here in Jeremiah, the 44th chapter, and verse, verse 15, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt in Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us, this is Israel answering Jeremiah, as for the word that you've spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto you, Jeremiah. We're going to do as we please. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven. Now, this is 600 years before the birth of Jesus. This is in the, in the 7th century B.C and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes, in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem, for then had we plenty of victuals. What? Then had we plenty of food. This is about food. It's what it's about. And we're well and saw no evil. But since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven, she gave us plenty of food. This paganism, this Milita, this Venus, this Aphrodite. Aphrodite means wrath subduer. That's what, he, that's what Mary, the Roman Catholic Mary was supposed to be in Roman Catholicism. The wrath subduer. She could subdue the wrath of her son. That's not, we go to Jesus. We don't pray to Mary and to pour out drink offerings unto her, and we have wanted all things, and have been consumed by the sword and the famine. They weren't consumed by the sword and the famine because they left off worshiping queen of heaven. They were consumed by the sword and the famine because they went after idols, and they left off serving God. And when we burn incense to the queen of heaven, and poured out drink offerings unto her, we did make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men. And that word cakes is the word kavan, K-A-V-A-A-N. It means sacrificial wafers. And that's where we get the wafer or the mass. Now the mass is eating human flesh. Roman Catholics say that if you do not partake of the Mass, that you cannot go to heaven. First of all, you have to be a Roman Catholic in order to partake of the Mass. And you cannot go to heaven if you don't partake of the Mass. During the Inquisition, it started in Spain, the Spanish Inquisition. It moved throughout the world. This was a move that was started by the Dominican uh, priesthood, and it was a move to persecute what the Roman Catholics said were all heretics, and they would slaughter and butcher people all over the world. You can find this in Fox's Book of Martyrs. And, in, and they killed 
they killed believers. They killed Jews and they killed Christians by the millions, by the hundreds of millions, because they were not partaking the Mass or the sacrament of the Mass, and we've accepted it in America today as though it was just second nature to us. And we are participating in the festival of Saturn. Now, how did that get into the church? Well, let me read one other verse here. Down here in verse, down here in verse 25. Or 24 and 25. Moreover, Jeremiah said unto all the people and all the women, Hear the word of the Lord of Judah that are in the land of Egypt. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, Ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands, saying, We will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore hear ye the word of the Lord, all of Judah, that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord, that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth, and God said, I'll scatter Israel, and that's what he did. And he killed them by the millions, and Jeremiah warned them, and this is that wheel of the year that they said gave them crops. Huh? Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of everybody there. Now, when you look at the old ancient wheel of the year, this section here is about planting. This section here is about harvest. And this section here is fallow, letting the land lie fallow during the winter. And this is about the growing right here. It was all about food. It was how we're going to get... Isn't that, doesn't that seem to be the main subject that we're involved in? Uh, now, let me get back to Halloween. Let me race this right here. I'm going to go into some of these other, this sowing, that, that left, furthest left point there on the, on the wheel of the year. And I, if you want a copy of the wheel of the year, I'll give you a copy of it. You've got to go in and study all of this from, and it's all the same thing. Now, let me just give you this before I go further. Of course, December the 17th to December the 24th. That December the 24th is the most important day in the year to the Muslims. To the Muslims. The Muslims worship the Lord Moon or the Man of the Moon. They worship... Uh, they worship Allah, didn't they? They worship Allah. In Israel, be, got involved in worshiping this moon god or this Lord Moon. They worship this in the ancient world. They worship this. Uh, you find it over there in the 64th chapter of Isaiah. They actually went after Allah. The Bible says that Israel poured out drink offerings to that number, number, and the word number is M-E-N-I-Y. And Mene was another name for Allah because the moon numbered the seasons. There in the first chapter of Genesis. The moon numbered the seasons. So they worshipped they worshiped the Lord moon. Israel was involved in every bit of this worship. And God scattered them because of it. When Israel, in 1 Samuel... Through Second Chronicles, for a 500-year period, from Samuel, the, first, the, the last of the judges, the first king, Saul, through David, and, and through Solomon, and all these kings. Here's the kings right here. There they are right there. All these kings, they kept going after Baal in the grove, all the way through Second Chronicles to Zedekiah, the last king of Israel, 
Of course, David didn't go. There were only three kings that were righteous in Israel. Who were they? David, Hezekiah, and Josiah. And all the rest of these went after Baal in the grove. God said, I'll scatter you over the earth. So he scatters them for 2,600 years, and they're scattered. And this is what prophecy is all about. And when you go over there to Luke 21, 20 through 24, when you see Jerusalem encamped by armies, know that the desolation thereof is nigh. And let those that are in Judea run for your life. Don't enter into the cities because these are the days of God's revenge upon his people that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Well, God gives Israel a time period, 70 times 7, or the 70 weeks of Daniel, 70 weeks, to repent. But 69 of those weeks end when Jesus comes in on the young colt of an ass in Luke the 19th chapter to be presented as king, but they crucify him as the Passover lamb. And when he comes into Jerusalem, he looks out over Israel and said, If thou hadst known, even thou in this thy day, the things that belong to thy peace, Israel, but now you're blinded. And the whole, the whole understanding of this, in Acts 2, 50 days after Jesus is crucified, God pours out of his spirit which is the truth on all flesh or upon the Gentiles. And he's got a Gentile church. And the reason he did this is because Israel went after Baal and the grove, the same system that Constantine brought to the church and called Christ mess. And we just dropped an S and called it Christmas. And if you're here and you hadn't heard this before, it was common knowledge 150 years ago in America. Christmas, it was against the law to celebrate Christmas 300 years ago in America. The Puritans came here and they said, we will not have this Roman Catholicism in America. They've killed us by the millions in England. They've killed us by the millions in Europe. And we will not have it. Well... The Unitarians and the Universalists had the law repealed back in the late 1600s and they kept trying to get the church involved in it for the next 150 years. And it wasn't until 1856, 1856, that was the year that Christmas was declared a national holiday in America even in the 1850s, you could not find Presbyterians and Baptists and other Protestants partaking in the Christ Mass. It did not take hold till just after the 1900s. All of my great-grandparents knew that it was paganism. If you get around some 85, 90-year-old person, they'll say, yes, my, my parents used to tell me this was pagan and wouldn't let us have anything to do with it. It is heathenism. It is the grove worship. And of course, what they were wanting to do, so God extends the gospel to the Gentile church. Why? Because he blinds the eyes of Israel because they went after this system that we brought in the church and called Christ Mass. Dropped one of the S's, pulled the two words together, and it's eating human flesh. It's what it is. It's everything that Catholicism is focused and founded on. It's heathenism, and it's not just pagan. It is the paganism of the Bible. God destroyed Israel for it. And he said, I will, you'll fall by the edge of the sword. You'll be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And that began to happen May 14th, 1948. May 14th, 1948, 
that began to be fulfilled because that's when Israel became a nation again for the first time since they were carried away by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. And why were they carried away? Because they went after Baal in the grove, Hercules and Venus. And Hercules' birthday was December the 25th. And we're back to the whole same system, aren't we? God delivered this nation. Now, why did Constantine bring that into the church? That The Halloween is just the Celtic form of it. That's all it is. When Constantine brought it into the church in 325 A.D., he was about to lose the empire to a bunch of marauding... I call them... Uh, uh, they were just a bunch of barbarian uh, Al-Qaeda type types. They were pillaging and raping. And he said, I'm about to lose the empire. So he says, I've got to do something. He says, and for about 150, 200 years, the Roman emperors were saying, if we could only amalgamate paganism and Christianity, I can stop these these terrorists from raging across Europe. The, the Constantine was, he had a fear that the Goths and the Visigoths and the Huns and the Vandals and these Celts and these Gauls were going to come across Europe and that they were going to sack Rome. So he said, if I can appeal to their better side, if I can appeal to them. So he, what he began to do, he amalgamated the two systems, Christianity and paganism, he mixed him up a religion. One of the first things he did, he just put the sun god behind the heads of the saints, and that's called halo, or it's called the nimbus. And the nimbus was just a variation of the swastika. That's what it was. And you'll find the nimbus... You'll find that everywhere sun worship is, you'll find it even actually on some of the old garments of the American Indian because they were sun worshipers. Now, Constantine brought it into the church and that way he said, I can pacify the pagans. Well, of course, did that pacify them? Not really, but it was underway. Roman Catholicism was underway. And that's the mass. And I brought it out. I bring it out every week. When you go over where the Roman Catholics twist the word of God for the mass, you find it in the sixth chapter of John. Look at the sixth chapter of John. I'm going to get back to Halloween here in a minute. <clears throat> sixth chapter of John. And it's amazing how little America knows. Now, I haven't spent a little time. I didn't spend this last week studying this. I've been studying this for decades. These, this is the truth. But in order to believe this, you've got to make your family mad. You've got to make people think, you've gone off to a cult, haven't you? And that's what they call us, cult. And isn't it amazing? They don't even know how, what to call us because cult comes from cult of eight. And the early Christians were called, they were called the Christian cult. What they mean is, oh, cult. Now, if you're going to call us something, that's what you mean. You don't mean this right here. Oh, cult means to hide. It means you keep things hidden. When you cultivate, you cause something to grow, and you, you fertilize it, and you feed it, and you water it. So, and you're going to be called names. In order to take a stand for the truth, but I'll guarantee you, there's not hardly anybody in here that your great-great-grandmothers did not know that this was pagan. There's not, in fact, there's, if you can go back three to four generations in your family, not hardly anyone's ancestors here were celebrating any form of the Christ Mass. We can back up to anybody's ancestors, back up to the mid-1800s, and your ancestors were not celebrating it in America. Yeah, Dwayne. My, my grandfather kicked Uncle Paul out of the house back in 1938. 
Well, that's what they felt about it. That's the, he said, we're not, that's right. That's right. Now look. Yeah, if you weren't Catholic. That's right. That's right. It is Catholicism is what it is. That's what Christ's Mass is. And what really amazes me is, I was a little boy back in, in, it doesn't take a genius to figure this out. I was a little kid back in the late 40s and early 50s, and I remember my father went out, and we were real poor, and we lived in about 700 square foot house, but boy, we had to have one of them big boxes about that big, and had a TV screen about like that, and it'd go and we'd watch everything, and we'd watch the Midnight Mass, and as a little boy, I mean, as an 11 or 12-year-old boy in the early 50s, I would sit there and look at the screen, I'd go, Midnight Mass. Here it is, 12 o'clock on Christmas Eve. Wait a minute, Chris, is that Christ's Mass? And as a little boy, I'm sitting there evaluating, and nobody had told me anything. Is this Christ's Mass? Is that, and that's, wait a minute, this is Christmas Eve, and I think Santa Claus, I think he, He's called St. Nicholas. I think St. Nicholas was a Roman Catholic somewhere along the way. He was a Roman Catholic bishop of the 4th century. When you write to him, you're writing and talking to the dead. That's necromancy. It's just paganism to the core. Yep. And that's one of the capital offenses in the Bible. You talk to the dead, you die. Now, here's where the Catholics get it. John 6, verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh. The bread is the flesh. Bread is the flesh. which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except you eat, this is where they get the mass, Except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eateth my flesh, and the Roman Catholics say you have to eat the literal flesh of Christ, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Well, what does that mean? Eat flesh and drink blood was an old, ancient Jewish idiom, and Jesus explains it in verse 55. He says, for my flesh is is meat indeed and my blood is drink indeed you want to know what eat flesh and drink blood is you define the word indeed the word indeed is a l e t h e s it means of truth you eat and thy word is truth and the word of god is the bread of life we eat and drink of this Word, not literal flesh. That's not the mass. And that's what they've turned it into, isn't it? Of truth comes from A-L-E-T-H-E-I-A, aletheia. And aletheia is a construction of the word lanthano. And that word means to lie hid, hid or to conceal. And when you place the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, in front of a word as a negative particle, it negates the word, gives an opposite meaning. Alanthano translates aletheia. It means not to hide anything. What I'm doing this morning is eating flesh and drinking blood. I'm telling the truth. And you know what people want to do to me for this? Call me nutty, call me crazy, say he's got a devil, he's a cult, something's wrong with him, is he out of his mind? Oh, well, what about the rest of the world? The rest of the world's not doing this. Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil. This is not a vote. It's wicked. Do you think America's in good shape? What's so bad about Christmas? Let me ask you this. What's so bad about America? Huh? Are they in good shape? They have a form of God and said to deny the power thereof. We're in the apostasy. We're at the end of time. 
if there's supposed to be this great worldwide apostasy at the end. And that's where we are. Aren't we? What I'm saying sounds crazy if you go to a church down the street and the preachers, and you can go down the street and say, well, I'm going to take this to my preacher. And he will talk in a circle and lie to you and not tell you the truth. It's not like this is some small thing I've studied. I started studying this 48 years ago. And I started seeing Baal in the grove. And I started seeing the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast all through there. And I kept looking at that at 22 and 23 years old going, what is this? What is this Baal in the grove? And I began to look these things up. And I came home one day back in the mid-80s. And because I had studied prophecy all this time, I walked in the house one day and I said, Merry Christmas is pagan. We can't do this anymore. And I didn't know who did it and who didn't do it. I didn't know. And as soon as you say Christmas is pagan, somebody's going to say, you're a Jehovah's Witness. Well, I believe in Jehovah and I do believe in being a witness. And the word witness is martyr. It's meaning a martyr. But no, we're not Jehovah's Witnesses. This is what, this is what the Protestants believed 150 years ago. They knew what I am saying is true. And when you go into history, you're going, oh my, what is wrong with this nation? Let me give you something here. I'll read Jeremiah 10, yeah. Here's the Christmas tree, here it is. Mary wants me to read it, I'll probably read it several other times. Here's the Christmas tree. And the Christmas tree is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil from the garden. It traces all the way back there. That's what the little red balls are on the tree. It's that supposed to be the fruit of the tree. Whenever, whenever they would, when December the 24th came, they would throw the Yule log into the fire and it would spring out on December the 25th in the form of a tree. And the tree in the ancient world was said to be the giver of all divine gifts to man. What are all the divine gifts to man? Huh? Here's all the divine gifts to man. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. All that is in the world, John said, all in the world, here is what the tree gives. Here's all that's in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, it's of the world. You can trace this tree worship back to the Garden of Eden. It goes back to Babel in Genesis 11 chapter, but when Nimrod and Semiramis started Babel, or the Babylonian system, they reinstituted Adam and Eve worship in the Garden. We are... We have corrupted ourselves. I told Brian the other day, I said, I feel like, I said, what we are, and we get weary. Do I get weary and tired and sad when the world doesn't want to believe these things? I get so depressed and distressed, I would have to be an insane man to preach this if it isn't true. It makes nothing hardly but enemies, except for the elect that can hear. And it depresses me to no end. I go out in the world, I think, the world doesn't care. I've spent my life studying Bible and history and culture and and I'm thinking, is the world just stupid? Are they just stupid and they can't understand? They don't have ears to hear, do they? You cannot deny everything I'm saying is the truth. I am appalled in America. And the preachers and one preacher here in town said, well, we baptized Christmas and made it clean. He even said he knew it was pagan. Well, Job 14 and 4 says, Who can bring a clean thing out of unclean? Not one. Nobody can clean up the Christ mass. It was paganism from the start. That last verse of the 18th chapter of Leviticus, verse 30, Therefore shall you keep my ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs. Don't even keep the customs of the heathen. I don't want you doing it. Huh? And what did he say over there in Jeremiah? Well, let's read Jeremiah 10. 
hear ye the word of the Lord, which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. I don't want you to learn how his way and how he serves his gods. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them, for the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it with silver and gold, they fasten it with nails and hammers, that it move not. What, do you, what is that? That's where it comes from. In the ancient world, McClinic and Strong Encyclopedias, when you look up Ashtaroth, the female deities were worshipped in the form of a cone. And I'm not trying to be crude, but it was the picture and the type. It was sex worship of the ancient world, and the scholars tell us it was the pubic triangle. That's what they worshipped in the ancient world. That's the reason they cut it off the top of the tree. And Mr. Layard in Layard's Nineveh, one of the great historians of the mid-1800s, quoted by every major scholar since his day, he says that they put a star on the top of these triangles. Jeremiah says they put silver and gold on it and they put a platform under it. Now you tell me what that is. Huh? What is it? It is the hellish heathenism that we have brought into our families and our homes. It is the tree worship and it is all that's in the world. And people say, well, we're not worshiping the tree. Well, worship. Let me see. Proscuneo. P-R-O-S-C-H-U-N-E-O. Proscuneo comes from pros, meaning toward, and kuan. Kuan is a word that means dog or hound. It means to lick the hand. It means to lick the hand. It means whatever you'd have me to have, I, let me, and it has the idea of when, and when, when a wolf is the alpha wolf of the pack, and you see the others coming in with their tails between their legs, and it's just, whatever you want me to have, can I eat? You mean, when you kneel down to the tree and say, here's yours, and here's yours, and then you start opening up, well, I don't like this. Are you worshiping the tree? Huh? Another word, worship, is zeteo. It means to seek after. Are you seeking after the tree? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And those are the same three things that Eve saw in the tree. She saw a tree that was good for food. It would fulfill the lust of her flesh. She saw a tree that was pleasant to the eye, the lust of the eye, and she saw a tree that would make her wise. That's what's in the tree. That's the fruit of the tree. That's what it is. I know this upsets people that hasn't heard it, but it's the truth. And people will say, but we don't do it that way, don't they? You know what Christmas is? Christmas is a, uh, it's, it's decorating up a pig. That's what it is. There it is right there. It's taking a pig and putting a ribbon on it. It's like saying, I, I wrote a paper one time, it's like saying some guy runs out and robs a bank and then he runs home and he puts on some tights and a little tutu and, and then he puts on his little tight and he says, I am a ballet dancer. Well, what is he? He's a bank robber. You can redecorate something and relabel it and rename it all you want to and it is what it is. It, Christmas was an old, ancient, pagan orgy in the ancient world. What is it today? It's a drunken orgy. And the Christians are saying, but we want a part of it. 
Yes, Jesus was God in the flesh and he died to save sinners. But God is going to bring judgment on this nation for the corruption that we have done to his word. He's not going to put up with it, is he? No. And all you have to do, look here. It's amazing. Just utterly amazing. Go into Encyclopedia Americana. Americana. The name derives from the old English Christus Mass, Sir Christ Mass. And then he says, the reason for the establishment of December the 25th as Christmas is somewhat obscure, but it usually held that the day was chosen to correspond to pagan festivals that took place around the time of the winter solstice when the days began to lengthen to celebrate the rebirth of the sun. That's the Americana. You don't have to go anywhere fancy to find out about these truths. Go down to the local high school library. Pick up an Americana. Christmas customs are thought to be rooted in the ancient pagan celebration. It is held by some scholars that the birth of Christ as the light of the world was made analogous. It was made analogous to the rebirth of the sun in order to make Christianity more meaningful, meaningful to pagan converts. That's Americana. Many early Christians decried the gaiety and festive spirit introduced Christmas celebration as a pagan survival, particularly of the Roman Saturnalia. They considered the birth of Christ a solemn occasion. Customs of all lands have been added through centuries, making Christmas today the greatest folk festival in the world. Folk festival! It was in this period that the idea of the Lord of Misrule, during that seven-day period from 17th to the 24th, they would go out and find a bum or a heathen, some guy off the streets, and they'd shift the roles between the king and him, and he would rule, and they'd have a drunken festival. And they called it the Festival of the Lord of Misrule, reached its greatest expression a common person or a servant of the great Lord was chosen to rule with absolute authority during the Christmas season and after his rule resulted in uncontrolled frivolity. This tradition originated during the Saturnalia when slaves became the equals of their masters. The idea of using evergreens at Christmas time also came to England from pre-Christian northern European beliefs. Celtic and Teutonic tribes honored these plants at their winter solstice festivals as a symbol of eternal life and the druids ascribed magical properties to the mistletoe and that was their favorite plant mistletoe in particular the evergreen holly was worshipped as a promise of the sun's return and some say that well no that's something they added to it and then he says that the Christmas was not celebrated by the Puritans or Calvinists. When the Puritans came to power in England under Oliver Cromwell in 1642, Christmas celebrations were banned as evidences of anti-religious royalist sentiment. Penalties were exacted for celebrating Christmas. The Puritan tradition was brought to New England where... Christmas did not become a legal holiday until 1856. And then you've got all these religious encyclopedias, and then you've got the Britannica, and they'll all tell you about it. It's heathenism. And what's wrong with it? Well, just everything else that's wrong with America, isn't it? Huh? It's, it's the system that God destroyed Israel for being involved in. Now, let me give you something here. Here's, here's a book written by this witch called The Sabbaths. It's the eight points on the swastika that was called the fire wheel in the ancient world. Now, this was the Baal worship. It was the Baal worship. Hold on here. It was the Baal worship of Israel. Now, we're going to get into Baal worship of Israel. We're going to go through all this before this season is over with. Baal worship, Baal worship of Israel. I started to give you something. I forgot what it was. Well, I'll remember it in a minute. Let me give you, let me read to you. This is the four feet. These are the eight feasts 
eight feasts out of this book called the Sabbaths. It's the eight points of the swastika. Let me give you something out of this. Just, uh, this will be my reading. How much time do I have, Mike? Okay. The Sabbath called Samhain, or S-A-M-H-A-I-N. There was a rock group that named themselves Sam Hain after Halloween. It marks the end of the third and final harvest. It is the day to commune with and remember the dead. It is a celebration of the eternal cycle of reincarnation. That is what the first of the year was. It was being reborn. Jesus didn't say, you must be born again and again and again. And they celebrated the birth of the unconquerable son at the first of the year. They did it among the Celts on November the 31st. It was the, it was the Celtic Saturnalia. That's what it was. That's what All Hallows' Eve was or Halloween. It was the summer's end. Samhain marked the end of summer and the beginning of winter for the Celts. The reason the Celts chose this point in time is their new year rather than Yule when the rest of the Western pagans celebrate it was because the sun is at its lowest point on the horizon as measured by the ancient standing stones of Britain and Ireland. Stonehenge. That's where it goes back to. They chose this rather than the Saturnalia. It was their form of the Feast of Saturn is what it was. It's still the Feast of Saturn no matter what people want to call it. Samhain is the night when the old God dies. And the crone goddess mourns him deeply for the next six weeks. The popular image of her as the old Halloween hag, menacingly stirring her cauldron, comes from the Celtic belief that all dead souls return to her cauldron of life, death, and rebirth to await reincarnation. Her cauldron is deeply a part of Samhain mythos, representing the great cosmic womb in which all things are conceived, grow, and are born. That's the fertility worship of the feast of Saturn of the ancient world when they appealed to Saturn so that they could have crops in the spring. The cauldron became a popular tool among European witches because unlike many pagan ritual tools, the cauldron was an everyday object needed for household chores such as cooking and cleaning. In some pagan traditions, the cauldron replaces the cup or the chalice. Samhain is popularly known today as Halloween or Hallowed Evening. It retains much of the original form and meaning it had long ago in Celtic lands. Despite the efforts of the church to turn it into an observance of feasting and prayer for their vast pantheon of saints, the church began by calling it Michael Mass, the feast day of St. Michael. It is a Roman Catholic holiday in the church. And they brought that out of paganism as well. So it was renamed Eve of All Saints or All Hallows Eve which precedes All Saints Day and still one of the holiest days in Catholicism. The church was finally forced to diabolize Samhain into a night boiling with evil spirits. When the church diabolized paganism and its deities, they began a successive campaign of fear among Christians concerning Samhain. Unfortunately, the idea of Samhain being a night of unleashed evil took hold in the collective mind and now all manner of mayhem and violence occurs around Samhain, though these terrors have absolutely nothing to do with the original meaning of the pagan holiday. Now let me read something to you about the idea. This was the night when the demons came back or the evil spirits came and walked the earth. Now, we've talked about demons. A demon was a, a great ancestor that came and lived in a person to guide them to fortunes and guide them and steer them through life. The pagan Samhain is not and never was associated with evil or, ne evil or negativity. Of course, when you get around witches, they don't say they worship Satan. They say they worship nature. That's what Wicca is. It's nature worship. They worship the trees. They worship fertility so they can have food and crops. 
The idea that evil spirits walk the earth at Sion is a misinterpretation of the pagan belief that the veil of consciousness which separates the land of the living. Our ancestors sought to protect themselves on this night by carving faces and vegetables to place near windows or the perimeters of their circle. These were the forerunners of the present day jack-o'-lantern. They wanted to keep away evil spirits. In the Saturnalia, they put fires in the window to do that. That's where the candles come from. These carved pumpkin faces are probably relics of even earlier custom of placing candles in windows to guide the earth-walking spirits along their way. That's the same. And they said this was a communion with the dead and they, had, they would feed the dead. They would leave out food at night to feed the spirits that came to visit. What is that? Well, they got the Saturnalia and the Christ Mass mixed up, and they convoluted the two. That is where they left the food out for St. Nicholas. They were feeding the dead. That's what it's about. And then in early, and I've got a book written by uh, Nissenbaum, a Jewish historian that, that's a professor at the University of Massachusetts he said in the mid 1800's at Christmas time that they would go from house to house and that they would ask for drinks or food and if you didn't give them food they would deface your house or do something to the house the trick or treat was originally a part of the Christmas season they're two systems and they're intermingled and intermeshed with one another they're both the same thing. The only difference is Halloween is not as deceptive as the Christ Mass, is it? Let me give you something about it. Window candles are commonly sold from September through January for use at Christmas. And they can be purchased rather inexpensively. Because they are electric, you avoid the risk for fires. And she tells you how you can get into uh, becoming involved in that. Now, then she says, this is amazing. The best known prankster at this Samhain is the Lord of Misrule. His job is to keep the circle from becoming, well, let me read this. A personification of a spirit of fun and hedonism. Hedonism, that's debaucherous, fleshly fulfillment who invades the circle creating pleasant havoc where they draw a circle and reminding us that even in the face of death there is reason to rejoice. His job is also to keep the circle from becoming melancholy at the thought that summer is at an end and the harsh days of winter lie ahead. In other traditions this Lord of Misrule called the Abbot of Unreason, the King of Bean, the Jester, the Master of Merry Disport in Norse tradition this is the time when power of Loki, the trickster god, reached its peak. You know, and what's amazing, when you get among the Celts, it takes you back. Probably the most, one of the most famous of the Celt worship was King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. It's just like she says, and you can get this out of Hastings. You can get it out of her books. You can get it out of any number of books. King Arthur was supposed to be, King Arthur and Guinevere and Merlin, these were just thinly veiled sun gods, worships what it was. Arthur was the picture and the type of the Messiah. He pulls the sword out of the stone, and Christ is the rock, and the sword is the word of God. And then, and then of course, uh, when you get into demons, our Lady of the Lake is Roman Catholic. We've got, we've got Our Lady of the Lake Catholic Church right here in Andersonville, don't we? Our Lady of the Lake was the one that gave Arthur the sword, and she was said, she was said to be Arthur's sister, Morgan Le Fay. Gosh. And this was it goes this is part of the Celtic, this is part of the Celtic uh, system. Morgan Le Fay. Morgan, you get, from Morgan, you get the word moor. That is the word sea. And Lefay means the fairy. 
in fairies were the Celtic, what the Celts, the Celt, what the Celts called fairies, the Jews called demons, and the, and this is what the uh, Arabs called genies, and this is what the uh, what the Greeks called guardian angels, guardian angels. The American Indian called totem, and this was this word means kinfolk. And Jesus said, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And the word kind is the word genos. It comes from the word gene, and it means kinfolk. From gene. And Morgan Le Fay means the sea demon. What did the Jews call the sea demon? They called that Dagon. Or the great whales of the sea. And dog is, dog is the word fish in the Hebrew. And they worship the, then they worship Dagon among the Philistines. And that was their form of sun worship. Notice how all of this ties together. Huh? And the Pope's hat, yeah. And that's the fish hat. That's the fish hat, or the fish's mouth, the mitre of the Pope. That's the fish's mouth. And of course, sometimes it's the closed, it's the closed pointed hat, and where does that, what's that? The priest of Baal, Baal, or the priest of Hercules, wore tall white pointed hats, white sheets, and they worshipped a flaming cross on Lady Day in the ancient world. The clan comes out of the same thing that Christmas comes from. If you're black and you're living in America, and you celebrate the Christ Mass, when you find this out, you're very foolish. comes from the same thing. I, I saw, and what's so amazing, why do you think the Klan wears those swastikas on their, on their sleeves? That's the fire wheel. I was watching Geraldo Rivera back about 10 years ago, and they had some Klansmen come out, and they had their Christmas tree, and they had swastikas all over it. And I said, that's it. That's exactly right. Thank you. <laughs> and some indignant, ignorant, so-called conservative Christian coming, you can't do that to my Christmas tree. I go, oh, no, leave that alone. That's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> Just astounds me. Yeah, yeah, they did, didn't they? Yeah. It was funny. It's funny. Because that's what it's about. The Klan, the Muslims, Christmas, Easter, Mardi Gras, Halloween, the Masons, they all come out of the same system. They're all rooted in it. Wouldn't that be something if the Muslims knew that they come out of the same system that the Klan comes out of? Yeah. <laughs> or the Masons, yeah. Mason. They all come out of the same fire worship system. What's amazing, you can take the morals and dogma of the Masonic Lodge, and it's got all about the Saturn, and the festival of Saturn and Osiris and, and Isis, and it's got the, the December the 25th, the birthday of Mithra or Hercules, and it goes, it's got all that in here. And that's a Masonic book. Now, let me read. Do I have any time, Mike? Let me read a little to you about the broom, okay? The witch's besom. The besom, B-E-S-O-M, or the broom. It's one of the magical tools, along with wands and staves. B-E-S-O-M. Besom. Is it B-S-E-N? Ian Besom, okay. Besom, it evidently comes from the German. Because of this uh, association, it is not surprising that they quickly become objects of magical protection. Besoms were often placed near the hearth of the home to protect the opening, and many pagans still believe a besom at the fireplace will prevent evil from entering. If negativity is a problem, just take your besom and visualize yourself sweeping their, those feelings out the door. Yeah. Placing the broom, you, jump, you jumped over 
at your hand fasting or your pagan marriage. And you remember, uh, the slaves in early America would jump over a broom. Yes. Under your bed is not only protective, but is said to perk up waning sexual appetites. For these, for those who wish to be married, a strong act of sympathetic magic is to jump a broom each morning upon rising and each night before going to bed from the new to the full moon. Ashes collected from spell work were thought to work best if kept swept up by magic besom rather than an everyday cleaning broom which might negate the beneficial energies of ashes. Now, I don't know how they make them magic. The besom is a phallic symbol. There you are back to the back to the fertility worship of the Saturnalia. It's all the same and was used by female witches in fertility rites. And it is from this that the idea of Halloween witch riding around on a broomstick also may have materialized. The sweeping in was usually made of the European broom herb, a feminine herb, thus the broom was complete as a representation of the male and the female together. It is fertility worship, no different than the Saturnalia than the Christ Mass. It's just as it's less deceptive. At Halloween, we are bombarded with images of the demonized crone goddess riding her broom across the moon. He said we are to, he said we are to avoid all of these fables, these vain fables. And the word fable is the word muthos, M-U-T-H-O-S. And that word muthos is our word myth. It's all a myth. Christmas is a myth. So is Halloween. So is Easter, Ishtar. And the church didn't do this. I was telling you about Morgan Le Fay means the sea demon of the sea fairy. And it was said that, that you had a convolution in the Arthur myths. She's got a lot about the Arthur myths in her books. And you can get a lot about the Arthur, Arthurian myth out of the Hastings Encyclopedia of Religion. And you get some out of McClinic and Strong. They were, they were sun and moon and tree deities is what they were. And Arthur was supposed to be the savior. And Merlin was supposed to be the picture of the type of Satan. And he could shift his shape into that of a wolf. Where did the shape-shifting start? It started in the garden when Satan took on the form of a serpent. And it all goes back to the Garden of Eden. That's where it goes back to. I haven't given you, I haven't given you an opinion this morning. I can't even begin to give you all the information that I got up here. And I, and I passed these out one year and I... And I just put all these verses on Baal and how Israel went after Baal, and that was Hercules. And Hercules, generic name, he had many generic names. Mithra was the fire god of Rome, and his birthday, you can look that up. Look up Mithra in the McClinic and Strong, and it'll tell you his birthday was December the 25th. That's why Pope Jews I gave Christ Mass its pagan name. I know this is more information than you ever heard before. If you've never heard this, you've never heard this much information before. I don't have any doubt. That's right. And when you blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, you continue to blaspheme against the truth. This is truth. And people will get... And I know that the hardest... The message I preach is hard. When you talk about daily cross, debt to self, self-denial. You talk about suffering persecution for righteousness' sake. You have to suffer persecution. You have to go through tribulation. Paul said so. Jesus said so. You have to face the truth. And when you face the truth, and you tell people God's predestinated a family before the world began, and he's predestined us to conform to the image of Christ, do you think Jesus was celebrating the Christ Mass? No. Actually, what, when you really look at Christmas, what is it? It's just a bunch of people fighting each other over who gave what, who what, spending money that they don't have. It oppresses the poor that can't participate in it, and they can't have the food that's involved in it. It's a, it's, it's a time to spend all your money. There's more booze sold that time of the year than any other time of the year. More drunks, 
more drunk driving, more people killed, more suicides than any other time of the year. And you can call that good. And Playboy has their Christmas issue. And they've got the Christmas cheer down at the liquor store. And all the world is seeking after some Christmas party. And they're going wild and crazy until January. And doesn't it put the greatest stress and strain on you you ever had? Huh? Well, it just, the strain is unbelievable. Well, I sold real estate for years. And the one main reason that young couples could not buy a house and couldn't qualify, they had ten credit cards that had loaded up for the previous four or five Christmases, and they couldn't qualify for a house because they still owed $15,000 on stuff they had long lost or is already gone. It's just a time of spending and glutting and stuffing ourselves, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you one thing that when you, if God, but there's no need to give up Christmas if you're not going to crucify the flesh and follow Jesus. And uh, my brother-in-law started screaming at me years ago when I said, me and Mary are not celebrating Christmas anymore. And I said, listen to me. And he's, he, no, I ain't listening to you. I want my Christmas. And he didn't even believe that the Bible was the inspired word of God. He wasn't even a Christian, but he wanted his Christmas. And I yelled at him real loud. I said, listen to me. Listen to one thing I got to say. I said, don't quit doing Christmas till God deals with your heart to live holy and righteous before him. In fact, don't quit doing anything. You're in a, you're in a theme park. You're going to hell. Ride ever ride. Yeah, twice. There ain't no need to quit doing something. Christmas is hard. And Halloween, that's easy to give up, but it's just a Celtic form of the Christ Mass. That's all it is. It's the same thing, the Night of the Living Dead. I mean, you can watch that in some old movie, can't you? And that's what it's about. It's about feeding the dead. It's about masses. It's about eating human flesh. If, you're not, if God doesn't deal with you on predestination and God's predestined a family to conform to his image, if he doesn't deal with you on a daily cross, if he doesn't deal with you on death to self, if he doesn't deal with you on you have to go through tribulation, if he doesn't deal with you and make you hungry for this word, don't quit nothing. Because when you start quitting stuff and you're trying to look good in front of the world, you, you're just deceived and you're a hypocrite. This is a hard thing. This message we preach is hard. Now, I'm going to be on this Christ Mass till we get to Christmas, and we're going to go through Baal and Ashtaroth and the Grove and Shemosh and Molech, and it's all in the Bible. And when you look up Shemosh and Molech, that's what your McClinic and Strong is good for. Look up the Ashtaroth. Read it, and you're going, oh, my goodness, oh, goodness. Are we involved in that? Yeah, we are. And what's... I, I got to... Got a piece of paper. I wrote these tracks. I got these Christmas tracks over here. I wrote one, What's So Bad About Christmas? What's so bad about Christmas? The pagan festival of Christmas is a tradition that is highly esteemed among the peoples of the world. The Bible says that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. If it were of God, the world would look upon it as foolish. The gangster, the thief, the homosexual, the prostitute, the abortionist all hate the word of God when he said, Thou shalt not. Yet they will party and involve themselves in the wickedest immoral acts while embracing the traditions of the Christ mass. Won't they? Huh? Many who attend church regularly while refusing to live righteously keep it as their favorite festival and holiday. The business person who is unethical and immoral in business dealings at Christmas time will disavow their marriage in order to have a sexual encounter at a Christmas party while getting drunk all in the name of Jesus' birth. It's a time of compromise for many who call themselves Christian, setting aside witnessing, calling people, calling men to repentance till January. Playboy magazine has their Christmas issue while liquor stores decorate with wreaths and holiday cheer. 
Christians are commanded to separate from ungodliness in 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17. Celebrate stuff and glut themselves with material things and all kinds of delectable foods while the world is destitute and starving physically and spiritually. Christmas is a time when true believers are expected to sit down at a family gathering passing out free forgiveness to unrepentant sinners as they curse and tell their off-color stories. Forgiveness is never an initial act. It is always a response to repentance. Paul said that we are to eat, not to eat or communicate with brothers living in rebellion against God. We are not to partake or walk with these unfruitful works of darkness. The United States comprises approximately 4.6% of the world's population. This minute segment of the world is parting and lulling themselves into an easy religion with no striving or wrestling over sin at the Christmas season while the world is dying, dying in starvation, squalor, and disease without Christ. To celebrate Christ is to honor him. To honor him is to keep his sayings, John 14, 23. If we are to honor him, we will dispense with vain traditions. We will get Christ out of the mass. We will rid ourselves of this heathen festival of the mass. We will throw out the pagan birthday of Hercules, December the 25th. We will remember Jesus' birth every day and we'll never separate it from the resurrection. And it goes on and on. Let's pray. Father, help us in this time of struggle. Lord, I, I'm tired. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Lord, I am weary, trying to tell the world the truth. And the world and all these preachers are just running straight down toward hell because they don't believe your word. Help us to see and understand what we're supposed to be doing. Lord, this is so hard to live by. Especially we feel like Lot in the middle of Sodom, that we're vexed with all this wickedness around us that comes in the name of Jesus. And it masquerades as Christianity, but they don't want your word. God help us. We'll praise you and glorify you for everything in our lives. And we will continue this, Lord, regardless of how difficult it is.